hello friends, thank you for joining our study. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the Baha'i administration. Uh, please know that this is actually a personal interpretation. It is my opinion and my understanding of the Baha'i writings. Uh, for an official view, please actually refer to the Baha'i writings themselves and jump over to Baha'i.org. Uh, in the description below, you're going to find an MP3 version of this talk, uh, a PDF with all the quotes that are actually being used, and as well, timestamps of the different sections of the talk, so you can always jump ahead or get back to where you were before. And if for any reason you would like to be alerted of upcoming videos, uh, please click subscribe. We turn now to a concept of what it means to know God. This first quote is from One Common Faith, a publication from the Baha'i World Center. What is it meant by knowledge of God? Baha'u'llah explains, is knowledge of the manifestations who reveal his will and attributes. And it is here that the soul comes into intimate association with a creator who is otherwise beyond both language and apprehension. I bear witness is Baha'u'llah's assertion about the station of the manifestation of God, that through thy beauty, the beauty of the adored one hath been unveiled, and through thy face, the face of the desired one has shone forth. Here we are told that the knowledge of God means the knowledge of the manifestations who reveal his will and attributes. Um, if there's anything, once again, <laughs> a very profoundly, profoundly rich notion within the Baha'i writings, it is what it means to know God. In very quick summary, it is the knowledge of God's messenger within the world of creation that we are living in. It is being able to see the reflection of his will and attributes in this world through the person of a divine messenger. It has been demonstrated and definitely established through clear evidences that by resurrection is meant the rise of the manifestation of God to proclaim his cause. And by attainment unto the divine presence is meant attainment unto the presence of his beauty in the person of his manifestation. Here again we're told that it is attainment unto the presence of his beauty in the person of his manifestation. These prophets and chosen ones of God are the recipients and revealers of all the unchangeable attributes and names of God. They are the mirrors that truly and faithfully reflect the light of God. Whatsoever is applicable to them is in reality applicable to God himself, who is both the visible and the invisible. The knowledge of him who is the origin of all things and attainment unto him are impossible save through knowledge of and attainment unto these luminous beings who proceed from the Son of Truth. By attaining, therefore, to the presence of these holy luminaries, the presence of God himself is attained. From their knowledge, the knowledge of God is revealed, and from the light of their countenance, the splendor of the face of God is made manifest. In this quote, we're actually told that they are mirrors. This is an analogy, once again, that is repeatedly used within the Baha'i writings. That actually the manifestations of God are themselves a mirror reflecting a divine sun. That divine sun, as we'll see in other uh, uh, deepenings, is not God himself, but the manifestation of God, reflected in the person of the different historical manifestations. And it's said here that it is impossible, the knowledge of God, is impossible save through knowledge of and attainment unto these luminous beings who proceed from the Son of Truth. So when we're talking about knowing God, remember this, it is impossible save through a messenger, one of these luminous beings, a manifestation of God. This world is a mirror of the next, its nature and its history. The worlds of God are in perfect harmony and correspondence one with another. Each world in this limitless universe is, as it were, a mirror reflecting the history and nature of all the rest. The physical universe is, likewise, in perfect correspondence with the spiritual or divine realm. The world of matter 
is an outer expression or facsimile of the inner kingdom of spirit. The world of minds corresponds with the world of hearts. I think this quote gives us a lot of ability once again to access understandings of the worlds beyond. And many can be teased out by looking at it. But what is this saying? That each world of this limitless universe is a mirror reflecting the history and the nature of the rest. So it's not just that there are laws, if you will, within this world that are facsimiles or shadows or mirrors of laws in the worlds beyond. But at the same time, there's in some sense, and this is the important part, it is reflecting the history and nature of all the rest. How is this done? The next quote is from Abdu'l Baha in London. As a Persian poet has written, the celestial universe is so formed that the underworld reflects the upper world. That is to say, whatever exists in heaven is reflected in this phenomenal world. Now, praise be to God, this meeting of ours is a reflection of the heavenly concourse. It is as though we had taken a mirror and had gazed into it. This reflection from the heavenly concourse we know as love. As heavenly love exists in the Supreme Concourse, even so it is reflected here. The Supreme Concourse is filled with a desire for God. Thank God this desire is also here. Therefore, if we say that this meeting is heavenly, it is true. Why? Because we have no other desire except for that which comes from God. We have no other object save the commemoration of God. The spiritual world is like unto the phenomenal world. They are the exact counterpart of each other. Whatever objects appear in this world of existence are the outer pictures of the world of heaven. So in here, the quote Abdu'l-Baha used is that the celestial universe is so formed that the underworld reflects the upper world. And then he says, Whatever exists in heaven is reflected in this phenomenal world. So how, I would ask, is the seeking of God and the finding of his manifestations reflected here? How is difference of belief and station that we find here reflected there? Many of the quotes we've actually looked at give us an understanding of this. For now we will continue to gather some more, if you will, quotes and notions before we bring them together. Work in the Kingdom Those who have passed on through death have a sphere of their own. It is not removed from ours. Their work, the work of the Kingdom, is ours. But it is sanctified from what we call time and place. So in this quote we're told that they work there for the Kingdom. Now, it is sanctified from what we call time and place, a notion that we've seen in one of the earlier stages, that we reckon, as Abdu'l-Baha says, the passage of time by our son. And we reckon place very differently than they will. And the point here is, their work, the work of the kingdom, is ours. In some sense, those who have passed beyond and who are believers are doing what we're doing. Can a departed soul converse with someone still on earth? A conversation can be held, but not as our conversation. There is no doubt that the forces of the higher worlds interplay with the forces of this plane. The heart of man is open to inspiration. This is spiritual communication. As in a dream one talks with a friend while the mouth is silent, so is it in the conversation of the spirit. A man may converse with the ego within him, saying, May I do this? Would it be advisable for me to do this work? Such as this is conversation with the higher self. We are told here that the forces of the higher world interplay with the forces of this plane. As humanity's purpose includes the carrying forward of an ever-advancing civilization, 
Not the least of the extraordinary powers that religion possesses has been its ability to free those who believe from the limitations of time itself, eliciting from them sacrifices on behalf of generations, centuries into the future. Indeed, because the soul is immortal, its awakening to its true nature empowers it, not only in this world, but even more directly in those worlds that lie beyond, to serve the evolutionary process. The light which these souls radiate, Baha'u'llah asserts, is responsible for the progress of the world and the advancement of its peoples. All things must needs have a cause, a motive power, an animating principle. These souls and symbols of detachment have provided, and will continue to provide, the supreme moving impulse in the world of being. And this quote is fascinating because in one sense it says that we are free from the limitation of time itself because we are listening sacrifices on behalf of generations in the centuries to come. And in some sense, when we actually engage with the true teachings of a cause that will one day win, if you will, that we are actually serving humanity far off. Anyone who has worked in the development uh, of social activism, uh, or in the world even of the sciences, can recognize this notion that by interacting in this world with causes that will actually grow and develop and, if you will, flower out through history, but we are working on behalf of those in the future. At the same time here it says, not only in this world, but even more directly in those worlds that lie beyond, we serve the evolutionary process. That these souls and symbols of detachment have provided and will continue to provide the supreme moving impulse in the world of being. So when we actually seize upon our purpose, our teleology in this world, to solve the true, the good, and the beautiful, that yes, we are actually interplaying on the planes of history, but at the same time, we are actually developing the capacities and capabilities that we are going to continue to use in the world beyond, because their work is our work. The topic of the great beyond is by far one of my favorite topics. And this subtopic within it is one of my favorite of the favorite. Uh, and it is guidance in the other worlds of God. The first quote is from Baha'u'llah. That city is none other than the word of God revealed in every age and dispensation. In the day of Moses, it was the Pentateuch. In the days of Jesus, the Gospel. In the days of Muhammad, the Messenger of God, the Quran. In this day, the Bayan. And in the dispensation of him whom God will make manifest his own book, the book unto which all the books of former dispensations must needs be referred, the book which standeth amongst them all transcendent and supreme. In these cities, spiritual sustenance is bountifully provided, and incorruptible delights have been ordained. The food they bestow is the bread of heaven, and the spirit they impart is God's imperishable blessing. Upon detached souls they bestow the gift of unity, enrich the destitute, and offer the cup of knowledge unto him who wander in the wilderness of ignorance. All the guidance, the blessings, the learning, the understanding, the faith, and certitude conferred upon all that is in heaven and on earth are hidden and treasured within these cities. Remember first that we were talking about this world mirroring the history and the nature of those beyond. And here he says that all the guidance, speaking of these cities of God, these books um, of the, each dispensation, all the guidance, the blessings, the learnings, the understandings, the faith and certitude conferred upon all that is in heaven and on earth. That we are actually seeing, I would suggest, the reflections of something above where faith, again, and certitude are needed in heaven. And that these cities seem to exist there as they do here, a mirror reflecting the history and nature of the rest. 
Another quote from the Epistle of the Son of the Wolf by Bahola. Therefore the voice of the true faith was lifted up, calling aloud again and again and saying, O concourse of the earth, by God, I am the true faith of God amongst you. Beware that ye deny me not. God hath manifested me with a light that hath encompassed all that are in the heavens and all that are on the earth. We are told here that his light encompassed all that are in heaven and all that are on earth, of course. And this is reflected here as it is there, is it not? And the day star of thy grace has shone forth with such brilliance that thou didst manifest him who is the revealer of thyself and the treasury of thy wisdom and the dawning place of thy majesty and power. Thou didst establish his covenant with everyone who hath been created in the kingdoms of earth and heaven and in the realms of revelation and of creation. This quote is a very powerful quote because it says that God established his covenant with everyone who had been created in the kingdoms of earth and heaven, in the realms of revelation and creation. I would suggest these are talking about very, very particular things. Um, and as we get into Baha'i's cosmology, meaning the study of the realms and existence beyond, that we will see some of these topics come up again. For now, we see that the communication of God is in all the worlds of God, the realm of revelation and of creation, the realm of heaven and earth, and that this covenant has been established in all of them. We see this notion, I would suggest, echoed in many prayers. This one from Baha'u'llah. I beseech thee so to enrich me, as to dispense with all save thee, and be made independent of any one except thyself. Rain down then upon me, out of the clouds of thy bounty, that which shall profit me in every world of thy worlds. In this prayer, he is asking to be given that which will profit him in every world of his worlds. Write down then for me in every world of thine that which will enable me to enter beneath thy shadow and within the borders of thy court. He here says, write down for me which will enable me to enter beneath thy shadow and within the borders of thy court in every world. Again from Baha'u'llah. I implore thee, O thou the king of kings, and the pitier of the downtrodden, to ordain for them the good of this world and of the world to come. Write down for them, moreover, what none of thy creatures hath discovered, and number them with those who have circled round thee, and who move about thy throne in every world of thy worlds. We hear that there are those who move about thy throne in every world of thy worlds. This means that in Again, in the picture, there is a throne in every world of God, innumerable. And that there are those who circle around that throne in that world. And then in many of the prayers we actually say on a regular basis, we're asked to be given that which will actually enable us to find what profits us in every world, which would be his throne. Rain down then upon us, O my God, that which beseemeth thy grace, and befitteth thy bounty. Enable us then, O oh my God, to live in remembrance of thee, and to die in love of thee, and supply us with the gift of thy presence in thy worlds hereafter, worlds which are inscrutable to all except thee. Thou art our Lord, and the Lord of all worlds, and the God of all that are in heaven, and all that are on earth. So we are asking in this prayer to supply us with the gift of thy presence in thy worlds hereafter, worlds inscrutable. It is a prayer asking for the presence of God, and I propose that this presence is the very throne of God. And we'll see as well that the manifestations, we've seen one small example of it, and the light of the manifestations is actually in all the worlds of God. O Temple of Holiness, we, verily, have cleansed thy breast from the whispering of the people, and sanctified it from earthly illusions. 
that the light of my beauty may appear therein and be reflected in the mirrors of all the worlds. So the beauty of God in this quote is actually reflected in the mirror of all the worlds. We now hear from the Bob. All praise be to God, who has, through the power of truth, sent down this book unto his servant, that it may serve as a shining light for all mankind. Verily, this is none other than the sovereign truth. It is the path which God hath laid out for all that are in heaven and on earth. Let him then, who will, take for himself the right path unto his Lord. It's fascinating in this quote because here the Bob says that this is a path laid out for all that are in heaven and all that are on earth. That his revelation is, if you will, a journey that people can take, and I would stress can take, for them to actually draw nigh unto the presence of God and be those who can circle around his throne in every world.